Hey, Bastish B here for 64K, and welcome to another video game company documentary. This one is for System 3, 1982 to 1991. And welcome back. So System 3 were a really important company for me back in the day. When I got that last Ninja for the first time, I got that for my birthday. I just couldn't believe the jump in quality that game took over everything else I was playing at the time. And System 3 continued even before that. They continued just to deliver absolute quality games on the Commodore 64. It was definitely the system that they excelled at 100%. So, as a company, I would say they're probably most famous for their C64 games. That's why for this documentary, unlike other ones, we're going to be covering the Commodore 64 years only. Everything from the origins of the company right up to their final C64 release. And because this is still a company that's in existence to today, I'll give you a brief little summary at the end of what they did later. As well as a brief look at some of the musicians and programmers that helped form the company. So without further delay, let's check out the origins of the company. System 3 are a British software company founded in 1982 by Mark Cale. They are one of the few surviving gaming companies from the classic 80s era that are still running today, with their headquarters in London, England. They are close to celebrating 40 years in the gaming industry as of making this. They are best known for the last Ninja trilogy of games on the Commodore 64, but there's a whole lot more to the story than that. System 3's penchant for only releasing games when they were done gave them the reputation for releasing quality over quantity which led the company to attract the UK's best programmers and musicians, including such heavyweights as Rob Hubbard, Matt Gray, John Twitty, Archie McLean, Ben Daglish, Chris Butler, Robin Levy, and Jerome Tell, just to name a few. They are still to this day Britain's most successful independent games publisher. Mark Cale has always loved video games, right from his first introduction to arcade gaming, playing on his Atari 2600. He was even European Space Invaders champion at the tender age of 14. Games were in his blood and it would serve him well in the future. But Mark also had another passion, namely photography. And after school, he became a photographer's second assistant to Norman Parkinson, who was a famous portrait photographer known for his pictures of the royal family. Mark would often regale his fellow employees about his love for video games, so much so that they suggested he follow his true passion, which was obviously games. Here's what Mark had to say about it. I realized very quickly that I wasn't gonna make a lot of money in the photographic world, so I started to look around for ideas. Between 1980 and 1981, his next job just happened to incorporate his two passions, photography and gaming, as he got a job for Atari Europe, where he was photographing Atari 400 and 800 goods for various advertising campaigns. The ever outspoken Mark continued to moan about how terrible the Atari games were at the time to the company's software development manager until he finally became fed up with Mark and told him to set up his own publishing company. That way, the games would have to meet his high approval standards before release. The spark was lit and Mark ran with this idea. He immediately spoke with his friends Emerson Best and Michael Koo about starting up their own software publishing company. They were both on board. Michael at the time was a computer study student and the course he was taking was called System Studies. The company's name then took shape with System and the three of them forming the basis of the name. Mark recalls, His course was called System Studies and because there were three of us in the company we felt we had the perfect name. Thus System 3 was born. Okay, so this is part of the show where we're going to go through the entire company's history. Obviously, we're only doing the Commodore 64 years, 1982 to 1991, but I'm going to show every single game that was released during that period, all 21 games. As we go through the years, though, I'll also be updating you on the company happenings and goings-on at the time. But for now, let's start back at 1982 saw the release of one game. With Mark's team in place and working out of his bedroom, the first System 3 game started to come together rapidly. It was called Colony 7 and was released in 1982. It was essentially a clone game of 1981's arcade game Colony 7 by Taito. The arcade game and System 3's clone was a mixture of two other games, a bit of Space Invaders and a whole bunch of Missile Command mashed together. Mark targeted the Atari 400 
400 and 800 line of computers for his first release to prove he could make a better Atari game than what was out on the market at the time. It wasn't the best game ever made, but still a pretty good start with simple solid gameplay where it counts. You control a gun emplacement while you defended your colony from space pirates attacking and stealing your food supplies. The game was made on such a limited budget that they couldn't even afford to hire an artist for the game's cover, so Mark's brother had to step in and do his best and draw a cover for them. Michael Koo, although credited on the game, didn't see it all the way through to completion and decided to leave the group. System 3 had already become System 2. Mark was quoted as saying about the game, It did well, or at least well enough to encourage us to make another game. So with a very shaky start and limited to no resources, they still managed to publish their first game and immediately turn their attention to their next software release. 1983 saw the release of one game. With only Mark Kale and Emerson Bess left in the team, they plowed on with their next game, deciding to focus on the BBC Micro for their next release. The game was called Laser Cycle and like its predecessor, it was a clone game of an arcade, or rather a segment of the arcade. As you can see by the cover, it's a blatant clone of the light cycle sequences in the Tron arcade game, which itself was based on the Tron movie. You have to drive your bikes that leave a death trail in their wake and try and get your opponent to crash into it, as well as fill in all the blocks on screen similar to the game Major Blink. It was a simple game, nothing to write home about. Its slower pace definitely hampered its gameplay a lot. So overall, I would definitely just stick to the Tron Arcade game instead. How they got away with their cover, however, is another miracle. It's blatantly a picture of the light cycle from Tron movie, with a bit of a mesh thrown over it. If you walked into any shop in the 80s, you would have thought it was a fishy licensed Tron game. I guess you could get away with anything in the 80s. Uh, well, almost anything. And to think their next game would be even more blatant on all levels. 1984 saw the release of one game. This year was the start of the company moving towards becoming a legitimate software developer and publisher, but we'll get to that shortly. Let's first take a look at their third game. Death Star Interceptor, released for the ZX Spectrum and C64, their first in a long line of Commodore games to come. As you can see from the cover, this one plays fast and loose yet again with copyright laws and looks like a legitimate Star Wars tie-in game. The Spectrum and C64 versions are essentially the same game, gameplay-wise, but the Spectrum version is way more blatant with its music, TIE Fighters and X-Wings. The C64 version, however, is a little bit more subtle. The music is a Star Wars variation, and all the ships have been changed to generic arcade-style enemies, as well as your own ship. The game comprises of three stages in different styles, from the hope for the best launch sequence, to the battle with the Death Star's fleet of fighters, to the inevitable Death Star trench run, just like in the original Star Wars movie. In fact, this game is almost a carbon copy of the Star Wars arcade game from Atari. Just in two instead of vector graphic style, at least on the Commodore 64. The game is leaps and bounds better than their previous two attempts, and starts to show elements of structure and story, which would become core elements of their later releases. It's essentially a shoot 'em up but with a nice variety in look and style. Mark was credited as programmer and Emerson on design. With their confidence at an all-time high and the game being relatively successful in the UK, they decided to make some bold steps and see if they could get the game published in the US. Mark somehow managed to organize some meetings with a few major US distributors like Electronic Arts and Activision. Nothing ended up becoming of these meetings initially, but bridges were built. Mark then met up with a small independent US software company while he was over there called Tronix. They were a company based in Inglewood, California and were formed in 1982 the same year as System 3. They only released about 10 games before going defunct, but Mark met up with them just at the right time. It wasn't his plan to import and distribute games from the US to the UK, but somehow a deal got made, with System 3 bringing three Tronix games to European shores. They became the first UK company to do this. Many more would follow suit though. The three games in question were Juice, Suicide Strike and Motocross, all for the Commodore 64, and they would be released in 1985 in the UK. Most of them actually came out in about 1983-84 in the US. Mark didn't manage to secure distribution for Death Star, but had taken a different turn and become a distributor as well as developer. Distribution would later become a major component of their business structure in later years, and is no doubt the reason they are still a fully functioning company to this day. 1985 saw the release of four games. 
1985 turned out to be a pivotal year for System 3 as all the hard work, relationship building and sheer tenacity of Mark himself would all pay off and send System 3 as a publisher and more importantly as a developer into the next level of game makers. This new year was jam packed with many highlights but before these let's take a quick look at those three imported games from Tronix that saw a release on the Commodore 64 on UK shores. First was Juice, an arcade style game, very similar in style to Qbert, just not as good. It's decent but pretty forgettable. Suicide Strike was an arcade style flight simulator, more arcade than sim with simple blasting action and some decent graphics. And lastly was Motocross, an extremely fast paced off road bike racer that was maybe a little bit too fast for its own good. It's really hard to control this game due to the insane speed, which is usually the opposite on the C64 for racing games. Overall though, these games are pretty forgettable, but they were out there building the System 3 name and at that time they were really struggling to get games made fast enough, so these titles definitely filled the gap so to speak. Mark and Emerson decided they needed to make waves if they were going to be taken seriously in the games industry. The upcoming PCW show in London seemed like the perfect platform for their big debut. The reality was that they had very few complete games to show and one in production, but that didn't stop them from going all out. Mark convinced his mom to mortgage her house so they could have the cash for the big splash. Here's what Mark had to say about it. In September 1985, I'd persuaded my mother to mortgage her house and throw everything into the PCW show. PCW, in case you didn't know, was a huge software and hardware convention to showcase the latest games and computers that took place in London. PCW stands for Personal Computer World. The organizers of the show were very conservative, Christian folk. You'll soon see how that became an issue. One of the games they were going to promote was called Twister, Mother of Harlots, for the ZX Spectrum. So before continuing with the show, let's check out the game in a little bit more detail. The game was designed and programmed by John Hare and Chris Yates, the founders of Sensible Software. This was their first game and just before they set up Sensible. John remembers Mark's pitch for the game. He said he wanted a game to be like Discs of Tron, but with a woman with big tits flying around in it. That was pretty much it. This was our first original game, so I was just experimenting with what I could draw with the package I had, using any ideas that came into my head. The game is a really cool mixture of a lot of shooter arcades of the day, with Space Harrier, Tempest, Tron all being very influential in its gameplay style. When released, it was reviewed really well by the resident Spectrum Mag, with Sinclair user giving it a 5 star rating, saying, Twister has all the vital ingredients, excellent graphics, good gameplay, varied tactics and an addictive theme. Mark was very impressed with the game and immediately commissioned them to make the C64 version of International Karate, a versus fighting game whose concept was by Emerson himself, whose love for Taekwondo in real life was the basis of the game. But for now let's jump back to the PCW show that they had secured a booth for. Mark felt they needed to put on a spectacle and really grab people's attention. In reality, they only had Twister, but they were going to promote the hell out of it and International Karate as well, even though the C64 version wasn't even complete. They decided to put on a show of theater type proportions. The crowds gathered every time the show started. For Twister's promotion, Mark hired a bunch of scantily clad exotic dancers to gyrate around the stage. The press absolutely ate it up every morsel. The show's organizers were absolutely outraged at the show of smut. International Karate's promotion involved real martial artists bouncing around a stage, smashing bricks and fake walls, sending the crowd into outbursts of applause. Mark knew it had worked. The coverage in the press and especially the gaming mags was everywhere. The show's organizers though were absolutely horrified and disgusted with the display. System 3 was then banned from attending all future shows. In retrospect though, it was probably something that backfired on the organizers as it just added to System 3's coolness factor, amongst its core audience, obviously teenage boys. Twister Mother of Harlot's title was eventually changed though just before release to Twister Mother of Charlotte, just to make sure the game was actually released in local software shops without too much hassle. A C64 version was supposed to be released but unfortunately never saw the light of day. It wasn't all smooth sailing though, as the team of Hare and Yates who were working on the C64 version of International Karate decided to leave and start up their own software company, Sensible Software, who would go on to work on many classics like Whizball, 
Parallax and Sensible Soccer to name but a few. They had managed to do most of the graphics for the game, but it was still a complete mess. The Spectrum version was done and released, but it just wasn't what Mark had hoped for. So in essence, everything was riding on this one game. The PCW show spectacle had caught some of the big publishers' attention. Many of them Mark had already met on his trip to the US in 1984. Activision and Epix were interested in international karate. Activision though decided to make a publishing deal with System 3. It was an absolute dream come true for Mark. The deal involved Activision giving System 3 a cash advance on all the games made. They would fund the development and marketing of the games, taking only 15% of the profit and the rest would go to System 3. The gateway was now open for mass distribution of the games in the UK and the US as well as for Activision. Here's what Mark said about the deal. It was quite amazing. We'd get a large advance on the games we were planning. You could only dream of a deal like that now. It just would not happen. It's too risky. But it was all breaking edge stuff at the time. Activision would, however, make a mistake and not publish International Karate in the US, as they decided to pass on the title based on the unfinished code submitted. Epix would later, however, pounce on it. But we'll get to that later. Here's Mark on the report he got back from Activision about the game. I've still got the report which said the game was typical European rubbish. He said the product would never work in America, that it didn't do this, that and the other and needed to be about stats. How wrong that report would prove would only end up helping System 3 and Activision's relationship in the future. And unfortunately 1985 also saw Emerson deciding to leave System 3. He didn't see International Karate all the way through to completion with Mark buying out his shares, leaving it now literally only System 1. 1986 saw the release of one game. 1986 may have only seen one game release and a version of a Spectrum game that had already come out, but this single version of a game put System 3 on the map not only in Europe but in the US as well. The game was the much delayed C64 version of International Karate, a game that had been promoted to death at the PCW show, and now they had to capitalize on all that publicity with a knockout game. Unfortunately, the game was incomplete and needed to be finished. Thanks to Mark's recently formed relationship with Activision, he was able to meet up with the up-and-coming programmer, Archer McLean, who was just coming off the high of Drop Zone, a brilliant and well-received shoot-em-up on the C64. Mark hired him to complete the game. Archer decided to redo most of the game from scratch. All the graphics were redone, as well as almost everything else. Mark was also lucky enough to get the talent of Rob Hubbard to do the music for the game. Rob's track were clocking at over 10 minutes long making it quite epic in size and something unheard of in game music at that time. Unless you were Rob Hubbard of course. <laughs> The game itself was a one-on-one -on -one versus fighting game, which may seem generic now, but at the time these type of games weren't generally made, and when they were, they were awful. This game just came together brilliantly. The complex but easy to use control scheme made pulling off countless moves flawless. The graphics themselves from the excellently animated characters to the gorgeous backdrop locations from around the world, it truly was an eye pleaser. The sound effects were hard and crunchy and really portrayed that feeling of smashing heads together. And let's not forget that unforgettable soundtrack that was not only beautiful but captured the mood of the game just so well. The game was released to rave reviews in the UK with Zap64 magazine saying in the June 1986 issue, the best thump em up we've ever seen and played yet giving it an overall 91%. With Activision passing on the game, another American giant jumped on distribution for the game. They were Epix. The C64 version of the game was shown in its full complete glory at the 1986 CES show in Chicago. It won their first ever award for technical achievement and was released in the US in 1987 by Epix. They renamed the game World Karate Championship and it went straight to number one on the game's sales chart, a first time a UK company had ever achieved this. Activision no doubt were blown away by this and Mark later said that it helped build the relationship even stronger. They weren't going to question or overanalyze anything they made after that and basically let System 3 do what they do. It wasn't all positive though, at least for Epix, who got sued after releasing the game by arcade giant Data East. I've covered this story completely in the Epix documentary, so if you want to see more detail, check that out. 
But in a nutshell, Daddy E sued them because they felt the game was a knockoff of their arcade game Karate Champ. The US judge ruled in their favor initially and the game had to be recalled. It was later overturned though in Epix's favor with the judge citing no one company could hold the patent on any single sport event. None of this really affected System 3 in any way, in fact it probably shed more light on the game increasing its popularity. Epix would not however publish the sequel in the US and left that up to Activision. 1986 was a start of System 3 as the powerhouse C64 developer that we all know and remember, as with their slogan at the time being, perfection is the only accepted standard. 1987 saw the release of two games. 1987 was another massive year for the company with not only a sequel to their number one game but also the start of their most successful franchise. With the previous year's success they were able to move to some real offices in London's Hatton Gardens near the center of London's trade district. The deal with Activision and the advance on games made 1987's gems possible. Now let's check out the two games in more detail. Both of these games were released on many formats. But the versions that most people remember the best are the C64 ones which pretty much cemented their reputation as one of the top developers for the computer. First let's look at my favorite C64 game of all time. The Last Ninja. A game I received for my birthday in 1987 after reading my issue of Commodore user with the review in it about a million times until I finally had it. I've mentioned this before on the channel but ninjas in the 80s were like rock stars of their time for kids. Don't ask me how many times I watched those trashy canon films and American ninja movies. It's more than most humans should possibly endure but damn did I love every second of it. The timing of the ninja theme could not possibly be any better. The original idea for the game was from Mark and was sparked by Atari's Adventure, a simplistic game that attempted a mix of action and simple puzzle elements to make up its gameplay. The Last Ninja at its base level will be something very similar. Here's what Mark had to say about its concept. The vision of The Last Ninja as an asymmetric adventure was something I was very passionate about. Obviously the machines back then weren't powerful enough to create fully 3D games, so an asymmetric viewpoint seemed to be the right solution to move away from the standard side-scrolling platform games. We wanted to do something a bit different, something that would really capture the imagination. And there really is no better subject matter than the idea of controlling a ninja, a spiritual warrior. The basics of the story is that you are Amakuni, the last of his ninja clan that was wiped out by the local shogun warlord Kunitoki. It's your quest to make it to his fortress and exact revenge for your fallen fellow ninjas. The game had already been in development for a while by a Hungarian team that had the base of the game built but became increasingly overwhelmed with what Mark wanted to accomplish and development flipped back to System 3 internally with Tim Best and Hugh Riley taking what was done and redoing it. Here's what Mark had to say about what they were trying to accomplish. We wanted to combine an arcade experience with adventure elements. So it wasn't like Double Dragon where you just go punch, kick, move, punch, kick, move. The whole idea was to solve a series of simple but realistic adventure puzzles. What we were essentially trying to do was take the square cursor blob from adventure on the Atari 2600 and turn it into a fully interactive 3D adventure. But they needed a lead programmer to start putting things together. So in came John Twitty. Mark had heard good things about John with his recently released Torchetti game receiving rave reviews in 1986 and him at the time working on Elite's brilliant C64 version of Akari Warriors. Not the spawn of Satan US C64 version bear in mind, the UK one. He called him up and asked him to come down to System 3 for a new job opportunity. That's what John had to say about it. I've got this wonderful concept, do you want to come down to London and start working on it? In those days games were put together normally quite quickly so I thought it would be a worthwhile thing to do. I went down to London, met Mark and Tim Best and Hugh Riley who was the graphic artist who I'd be working with. Out of all the games I've ever done, because they had already started on it, originally with some Hungarians, they already had plenty of graphics and Hugh was very quick at creating animation sequences. He used a sprite editor and he would literally knock up animation sequences of ninjas fighting with no thought as to how usable they were in the game. So when I I first came down I was shown some wonderful sequences of fighting ninjas but we then had to go through them and I would say that's practical yeah what you can fit into the Commodore 64 and I had to begin cutting things down 
it's probably the only game I've ever worked on where you have far too many graphics and you can actually pick and choose and say things like right that's impractical I can see how that's gonna work this animation sequence could work and that's pretty much how the last ninja started the game itself was massive it was a good old double cassette multi-loader they gave my good old tape deck a good workout for sure it comprised of six levels each one edging you closer to the Shogun's palace starting out in the wastelands then the wilderness palace gardens dungeons the palace itself and finally Kunitoki's inner sanctum it really felt like progression like logical storytelling progression that I'd never experienced in this style of action adventure game yes John on some of the technical issues of working on an isometric game in the early days of computing you became used to doing everything in X and Y then suddenly there was a heart to think about with jumping and stuff but it wasn't that difficult because the viewpoint is essentially 2d it's a cheat really the base gameplay boils down to a mix of arcade style action where you take out the Shogun's henchmen as you search the map as well as puzzles like finding the right items to pass certain obstacles. It was all quite logical unlike many games of its time which made the game flow really well. Yes, John on the basics of the combat. What happened was that we produced loads and loads of different animations with lots of different weapons then found we couldn't actually fit them all into the Commodore 64. So what we ended up doing was trying to create a sort of subset of all the animations to give a reasonable number of moves with a reasonable number of weapons. The one gameplay element at least from the original that most people dislike was the jumping sequences where you had to navigate over rivers or swamps to continue exploring the map. They required pinpoint accuracy or you'll die. After playing the game a million times I knew exactly where to stand and how to get across all of them without death. But if you're playing this for your first time it's definitely the one element that will make you want to smash your joystick. Yes John on the implementation of these sequences. I have to admit that Mark always kept complaining that it was too pixel perfect. And the reality was that I found it quite easy to finish the game. But I thought you had to make it reasonably challenging. So I have to admit I was the one responsible for making it so precise. I thought it looked really naff to be standing in midair, not on a stone, and so I thought it would be more realistic to have you fall in. I gladly accept now that the jumping sections were too tough, because when I went back and tried it again years later, I found it impossible. And how can any look at The Last Ninja be complete without talking about the sublime soundtrack? Again, still to this day, my favorite of any game ever. For this mock hired not one, but two musicians to accomplish this due to the scope of the game. Ben Daglish and Anthony least took up the challenge of creating this monster set list. Ben had already established himself as a top-notch set artist having great tracks in Beagles, Cobra and Loco under his belt just to name a few of my favorites by the time Mark called him for the job. Anthony Lee, however, the other musician was a rookie and was literally thrown into the deep end. That's what Anthony had to say about it. I did six tunes for The Last Ninja first of which was the one involving the creepy jungle music which was still my favorite. The inspiration is hard to nail down but it was probably the film Apocalypse Now. Very dense, troubled and scary moods were evoked. I spoke to Ben a few times while System 3 were writing it and heard some of the stuff he was writing. I liked it enormously and he had a far better musical education than I did. I seem to recall he was a percussionist for some classical orchestra in Sheffield. Although the music was composed by two completely different people with limited content contact with each other. Somehow it all felt cohesive and complementary and is responsible for so much of the game's charm and last ability. Yes, Ben's vague recollection of working on the game. I can't really remember much about it. I got the phone call from Mark asking me to write some level tunes. I wrote the music. And on meeting Anthony Lees. I only met the guy once on that one day. He said ha. I said ha. That was about it. We'd each written a few tunes. I think we said something like flip before loader and level music. Yeah, we were working separately. I didn't even know he had done any music, I think. The game features a whopping 11 tracks, all full song size without any compromises. It's quite a staggering amount of music for a 1987 release. The game was released to massive praise and excellent reviews across the board from Zap64's August 1987 issue, giving it a 94% overall, saying, 
enough depth and action to satisfy both adventurers and martial artists. The game ended up selling 7.5 million units, an unheard of amount in those days, and became the most successful Commodore 64 game ever released in terms of sales. The deal with Activision meant the game got a full release in the US as well, which just helped boost those sales numbers into the stratosphere. The Last Ninja became the second UK game to reach number one in North America. This game had such an impression on me at the time, it even inspired my brother and I to make our first kung fu home movie. There were a lot of kicks and punches thrown, some of them way more real than they were supposed to be. But that wasn't even all 1987 had to offer. Let's jump over now to Archie McLean's follow-up to 1986's international karate called RK+. It was renamed Chop and Drop by Activision for its US release. It dived back into the one-on-one -on -one versus fighting but decided to throw that notion out of the window and go one step further with three-on-three -three action, an unheard of take on the classic fighting game. The game itself is one or two player fighter with the computer always being the third man if selecting two player. It brought a whole new level of chaos into the mix and made the game way more fast paced than its predecessor, needing fast reactions as you were getting attacked from all angles. After every two rounds you'll also get the ball bouncing mini game which breaks up the action for a bit of a change of pace. There may have only been one background this time, but it was jam packed with little animations that would randomly occur, which was always fun to see. Rob Hubbard returned again for another epic single track piece of music that was as long as it was brilliant, and is another must listen Sid track from his massive library of gems. The sound effects again were sampled from the Bruce Lee movie Enter the Dragon and still have that solid crunch to them that make the action feel so good in these games. Primitive rotoscoping was also used to get the animations to be so smooth, with Archer reportedly placing cellophane over a TV and tracing frame by frame a background dancer in the movie Grease doing cartwheels and backflips, which was used in the game. The game was another number one hit in the UK. It wasn't as well received in the US as its predecessor, but still did well enough for Activision to be pleased with the results. It would later be re-released in the UK on the budget label The Hit Squad in 1990 with another bizarre cover featuring Steven Seagal, or at least an unlicensed knockoff of him. It sold extremely well and ended up becoming the Hit Squad's biggest seller ever. Commodore User Magazine gave the game 9 out of 10 and said, International Karate Plus is undoubtedly the best beat em up available on any any home computer, surpassing even its highly acclaimed predecessor with considerable ease, an absolute must for fighting fans everywhere. And Zap64 gave the game a massive 93% overall. There are also a lot of other great versions of this game, like the excellent Amiga version and the Game Boy Advance one as well, just to name a few that I really enjoy. And with these two games, not only were System 3 sitting on top of the world as far as game sales go, but also their reputation as the new ones to beat on the C64 was officially cemented in stone. 1988 saw the release of two games. System 3 was sitting on top of the world with two straight years of number one hits. They could have easily gone off the rails and started pumping out product to cash in on everything, but they stuck with their guns and continued the quality over quantity approach, which had served them so well up until this point, by only releasing two games that year. The Activision deal was used for Activision as well, to help out with the C64 version of Predator, which they borrowed a few of System 3's talents like Hugh Riley to help out with the graphics for the C64 release. Now let's jump over to our first game. Bangkok Knights, another versus fighting game, only this one employing Thai kickboxing as its martial art. The game was very eye-catching with its massive well-animated characters and a large set of moves to dish out the action. Mark decided to up the promotion level for the game even more so than the PCW show. He invited and paid for seven video game journalists of the time to fly to Bangkok to watch some live kickboxing action in its natural state. It was a massive stunt that paid off with every gaming magazine having an article about it commenting, with more attention and promotion be aimed at the game. Mark said, it was one of the first 
international launches that was done in a different country. Of course, all the journalists that weren't invited on the trip accused Mark of bribing the others for good reviews. Besides the fantastic Hugh Riley graphics, what I really loved about this game was that each character essentially had their own unique moves and stats, which made it differ from a lot of versus fighting games of the time, which were basically the same character with different colored clothes on. In a sense, it had the basis for what made the Street Fighter series so popular just a little bit later. And here's Mark on it. It was the first game to try and have different character attributes in the fighting game and different skill sets. The game's music also rocked, with Rob Hubbard returning one more time to System 3 for another set of rocking tunes that mixed in so well with the fighting action. But somebody else also joined Rob for the soundtrack. In came Matt Gray, who did the loader music for the game and kicked off the start of his excellent relationship at System 3 for the next few years. Matt had just come off a successful run of game over the last year or so, doing soundtracks on Qdex, Driller, and Hunter's Moon. But this one track in Bangkok Nights he considers his big break. He has Matt on getting the job. 1987 was drawing to a close. I was bored in my day job and I'd had a quick run of commissions and wanted to take the leap into full-time self-employment. Bangkok Nights was a real baptism of fire. One of those moments where you either grab the bull by the horns or capitulate with fear. I had just a few days to turn it around and luckily I hit the ground running and had the bulk of it done within a day or two. The success of it led directly to the offer of working on all of System 3's games for at least the next 12 months. And the next game they needed a lot of music for was The Last Ninja 2. The game was a ton of fun to play in one or two player verses. The stages were also extremely varied with tons of character and a massive open world kind of feel as you could go all over the place. The opponents were also very distinct making each one a slightly different challenge. You basically fight your way up from the jungle mountain sides to the local villages, dirty alleys and small town opponents until you reach the city of Bangkok and take the action to the real tournament. The chunky sound effects just like RK Plus and the digital speech really added that extra layer of class to an already well implemented game. I got Nats as part of my Christmas present in 1988 and my brother and I proceeded to load it up. He wanted first go so I was like sure figuring he would die quickly. 25 minutes later and a lot of multi-loading and he had completed the game on his first go. The button mashing gods were truly on his side that day. The game was another hit financially and critically, raking in the wards in the local UK magazines, getting a Commodore user screen star, a CNVG hit and a Zap Sizzler, with them giving it a 90% overall saying, the sprites are amazing, they incredibly big, well animated. Bangkok Nuts is superb and shouldn't be missed. And now onto the sequel to 1987's number one game. The Last Ninja 2 back with a vengeance. This was probably the first time I can remember where the harp of the sequel and reading every preview I could get my little hands on sent me into an absolute frenzy. It did not disappoint. The team of John Twitty, Hugh Riley and Tim Best were back as well as Matt Gray joining them on music. The story for this one has Kunatoki, the shogun you just defeated, uses magic to travel through time and space to New York 1988. You get caught in his wake and end up there too. The setting was obviously the complete opposite of the original. He has Mark on the idea behind the location and time shift. For the sequel we wanted to place a spin on things so it wasn't just the same as what had come before. That's why we decided to shift the setting to New York, a typical metropolitan hustle bustle type city. It provided us with a different graphical style and feel to the game. New York was an iconic city with very distinctive features so there was a lot you could do with that in the game. And if you looked at Highlander, he started in Scotland in the past and then he was in America in the present day. Because people identified with modern day America, it was the same principle with The Last Ninja 2. I think the change in scenery is one of its best features. They could have easily done a cut and paste sequel in Japan, but this new shift obviously allowed new elements to be introduced. I like the variations on the enemies, which the first was severely lacking. You had cops, thugs, and environmental attacks like deadly carny jugglers, killer bees and some crazy giant alligator in the sewers. He has Mark on the new additions. We were a bit limited with the mythical side of Lost Ninja 2, so there were more grounded characters like the alligator in the sewer. It was a little bit different from The Last Ninja and the freedom we had there, but then we could use things that we couldn't have in the first game like the helicopter, so we used that as a big element that helped you progress, and other things that were in the present day. 
Someone throwing something out of a window at you was just something different than having guards to fight on every screen. It was also something that you had to be aware of and that you had to learn as you were playing your way through the game. I think that came from the archer and the blood at the end of The Last Ninja. That was where we started doing that sort of thing and it was a progression from there. The setting also allowed Hugh Riley to really flex his graphic skills as each of its seven levels was pretty varied in look and style. Very much like the first taking you on a story like journey from Central Park, the streets, sewers, basement, offices, the mansion and the final showdown. Graphically it was quite amazing for the time. Here's John on making the sequel. Each time you have to make it bigger and better and more sophisticated. Thankfully Mark suggested the modern setting as there was only a certain amount you could do with ornamental gardens and stuff like that. So once we took it to New York it gave us quite a bit of variety. The puzzles also required a little more thought this time. It was all environmental and generally quite logical. Those pesky leaps of faith, the river crossing sequences were gone this time. Basically due to fan and review feedback from the first game. People generally hated them with a passion. <laughs> they were replaced with sequences that involved timing rather than pixel perfect leaps of doom and were a welcome change. Here's Mark on their implementation. The feedback from a lot of reviews and everyone else was that the challenges in The Last Ninja were really a shit idea. So we based the challenges in The Last Ninja 2 around a boat and made that easier to jump on. But it was moving so there was that challenge. So that was the challenge. It was a moving object and it was fairer because it was a timing challenge. But there are still a few pesky leaps of death in the sequel as well. And again just like the original the soundtrack was a masterpiece of Sid perfection. Every tune laid out in its massive of drum and bass style matching the gritty urban vibe of then 1988 New York. Just like Ninja 1 the quality of every track was top notch. Whether it was a simple loader track or in game music it rocked. It's amazing it was all done by one person. All 13 tracks full song size. Here's Matt Gray on his contribution to the game. Whilst I went to meetings and discussed things with the team at System 3 I went with what I wanted to hear. We discussed not doing cliche oriental tracks but in the end I just went with what came out. At the time it was great to be working on the sequel to such a success but I wasn't aware that it would have such an impact as it did. I probably read two or three reviews after its release just to see what was said about the music but I don't remember any fireworks if the music was ever mentioned. I certainly was not aware of the effect the soundtrack had on so many gamers of the era. It was a slow moving world back then. Information didn't travel very fast or at all pre-internet. And if you want to check out some brilliant interpretations of the Last Ninja 2 music Music, check out the band The Fast Loaders Ninja Musicology CD set which features brilliant versions of Last Ninja 1, 2 and 3 soundtracks. Check out my Fast Loaders video for more details. And Matt Gray himself also did a full remake of his Last Ninja 2 soundtrack which was released on vinyl and is absolutely stunning. I've done multiple Wired for Sound episodes on it. So check those out and if you like what you hear I'll leave a link in the description and you can pick one up for yourself. One of the most unique features about Ninja 2 however was how it was presented to buy in shops. There was a regular edition and a limited edition. So these types of things are a dime a dozen now but in 1988 it was something brand new at least for western audiences as it already had become a well exploited model in Japan. The limited edition came with a map, ninja hood and a plastic shuriken. This was another Christmas present for me. Unfortunately the mask and shuriken are long gone from my edition as I used to run around the garden mask on and lobbing the store at everybody I came across. This thing was a piece of hard plastic death. It could easily take out somebody's eye. And here's Mark on the idea behind the two versions. As lots of people were waiting for The Last Ninja 2 we decided to do two packs. The standard pack and the limited edition pack. And it was just like in Japan with people queuing up around the block to try and buy a copy before the shops opened. The only real problem we had with Ninja 2 was where we gave away the shuriken stars in a limited edition set with a mask. Unfortunately the shuriken ended up being a little bit harder than we wanted and some of the stores refused to stock it. If you look at it today health and safety certainly wouldn't allow us to do what we did back then. Many big UK department store chains didn't stock the game like WH Smith, Boots and a couple of others based on the fact that the shuriken could be a major safety hazard. None of this stifled its sales however and just like in typical System 3 fashion the whole fuss over the shuriken just helped promote the game in the media and to the consumer so it was a huge benefit again although unintentional. The game was released just before Christmas 1988 and it sold big. 
real big, with 13.5 million copies sold in its entire run. That's about double the original sales figures. Activision released the game in the US as well, and it was reported that 70% of Activision's software sales from 1988 was from The Last Ninja 2, making them and System 3 to have a very, very Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. 1989 saw the release of three games. After 88's huge success game and sales wise, System 3 didn't sit around bathing in the glowing reviews but busted forth with three games released all in different although familiar genres. Let's first take a look at their shot at the shoot 'em up style called Dominator. Originally this game started development in 1987, right after the success of The Last Ninja. Mark was a big fan of Japanese arcade games, especially shoot 'em ups, and wanted to make a game mimicking those styles. He cites R-Type as being the main inspiration for the game going into production. The original team behind the game was lead programmer Paul Hughes. Rob Hubbard on music and Hugh Riley on graphics. But that whole plan fell apart as Paul took a job and joined Ocean Software, so without a lead programmer the game was put on hiatus. By the time it continued, Jason Perkins was brought on board as lead. He had a massive backlog of experience working at Gremlin Graphics on classics such as Jack the Nipper, Avenger and Monty on the Run to name a few. Hugh Riley was still on graphics with Paul Doherty joining him and Matt Gray replaced Rob Hubbard on music and sound effects. It was a stellar lineup of talent to make a game that was not in their usual wheelhouse of style. The story is the usual one, the lone pilot taking on an alien invasion as you have to stop a giant planet killing alien form from obliterating Earth as its next target. The game starts off as a vertical scroller with the next three levels flipping to a horizontal view. It it mimics the classic Konami game Salamander in that respect, although the game was much shorter than most shooters at the time with only 4 levels in total. And this could also explain the game's biggest flaw, at least in my opinion, which was the insane difficulty. Shooters in the 80s were by default difficult, there is no denying that. Most were modeled after arcade games whose sole purpose was to kill you so you would insert another coin, but Dominator's difficulty was kind of off-putting. The first level is by far the hardest, which I think probably put most people off, which is a real shame, as the horizontal levels are really quite good and well designed. Some dodgy collision detection also added to level 1's frustration. The graphics overall though are really impressive, from their brilliant loader screen to the various alien organisms and bosses, it's a real feast for the eyes. And here's what Paul Doherty had to say about them. I'm pretty sure my input was limited to sprites, so I didn't get to do the landscapes. I was heavily influenced by RO and Armalite, so perhaps that comes across. Hugh's style was just very different from mine. Like with most things at System 3, Kale let me do what inspired me at the time, and he was clear which bits worked for him and which didn't. But Hugh had designed these graphics before departing to form Vivid Image, with his cohorts John Twitty and Mev Dink, so we were never in the same building working on the game. His part was done by the time I showed up, and I was there to add some polish. Sound effects and music again by Matt Gray have a constant thumping beat helping keep the engagement and feel of the everything or nothing situation of your character going deeper and deeper into the alien half. The game received mixed reviews for the time, mostly positive but nothing mind blowing. It received a C plus VG hit, a Commodore user screen star, and an average 75% in issue 53 of Zap64, with them saying overall, interesting graphics combined with good gameplay to make an above average shoot 'em up. I'd personally give this about an 80% on the Zap scale overall. If you can survive that first level, there's a pretty good game hidden back there. We're now going to flip back to familiar territory with the second game, Tusker. A game in a similar vein to the Last Ninja series, although ditching the asymmetric look and using a side flip screen approach, with you able to explore the entire screen and not being stuck on a 2D plane. Most of the team from Dominator were on this one as well, with Hugh Riley and Paul Doherty on graphics, Matt Gray on music, and Duncan Meech as lead programmer. Duncan himself was a former employee at Palace Software and joined System 3 in 1987, and worked on some capacity on all their games during the this period including the Last Ninja series. This was Duncan's turn to shine as he took on Tusker as lead programmer. This is his recollection of joining System 3 in 1987. I joined System 3 when they were still operating out of a suburban house in glorious Watford. The house was where John Twitty developed the Ninja series of games. But the most memorable aspect was the R-Type arcade machine in the garage. 
Tusker's story and premise is definitely a product of let's do an Indiana Jones game on the C64. And with the third indie movie hitting cinemas that year, I'm sure that wasn't a coincidence. The story involved you traveling to Africa to search for the mythical elephant graveyard, where all that expensive ivory was just lying around to be sold into mass fortunes for whoever found it. As a kid living in Africa, my dad had already told me this story about the elephant graveyard. And then finding out about this game, it just piqued my interest to the max. From the previews, it looked like the Lost Ninja and Indiana Jones had a baby. And I was definitely on board with that for everything it had to offer. Duncan recalls the origins of the project. I think Tusco was my one and only effort for System 3. The setting and main character were obviously an attempt to cash in on Raiders of the Lost Ark franchise. As I recall, Mark Kale's inspiration came purely from watching Raiders. System 3 was still concurrently developing the Ninja series, so doing something different seemed appropriate. Tusco was a visual feast at the time. I loved the look and especially the variety of the levels. They really went out and captured all the cliches of modern and classic B-movie adventure films to make up all its levels. From the barren deserts, underground caverns, lush forests and mountain regions to the claustrophobic cannibal village and temples. It covered all the best of grand adventuring in one package. Due to System 3's massive turnover for employees, which we will discuss soon, the graphics were handled by a very large team of artists all contributing bits to the puzzle. Yes, Duncan on its visual creation. I don't think the plan was to go big on the art. There was just a lot of churn for various reasons. There were some thrasher people on that project, but I don't think they all worked full time on it for the duration of the development. The in-house developers were Hugh Riley and then Paul Doherty. Rich Hare and Gary Carr were contract help, as I recall. System 3 was trying to create premium products, not the usual six week games that were common back then. Hence the team was larger than your typical C64 scroller. Paul Doherty, one of the many graphics artists on the project, recalls his time on it. I came to System 3 to do Vendetta and Tusker was already well into production. Hugh Riley had created the bulk of the graphics. I only did a few screens, the Elephant Graveyard for example. I wasn't on the game long and only at the very end. There wasn't a team of artists, artists were brought on as needs them Merged, with little or no overlap. Tony Hager worked with me, so that's the only time artists were working concurrently on Tusker that I'm aware of, unless Hugh overlapped with others. We used the screen designer John Twitty wrote for The Last Ninja, which was also used for Vendetta. The puzzles and action were very much in the same style as The Last Ninja, with basic fisticuff action until you find a weapon such as a machete or a gun with limited ammo but with the same results as a one hit shuriken from the ninja games. You also have two health bars, one for energy and one for water as you have to keep hydrated to keep going, so filling up your canteen is part of the gameplay. If either one of these bars flatline, you're dead. The puzzles were a little more devious than the ninja games. Some combining of items were needed to solve some of the sophisticated situations and things weren't as obvious as they seem, although I did manage to complete the game back in the day without any help so it's not a possible in any way. Jonathan Dean, a long time producer on many System 3 games including Dominator and RK Plus, recalls how the design process on these games fell together. No one really designed System 3 games. There used to be a central idea which the team would work on for a while. Then Mark Kale would look at the playability and make a bunch of changes. I called it unintentional iteration. It worked quite well when you look at the end products. With no shortage of technical and creative talent there, I contributed little to the design. My role was mostly to keep these guys on track, help them focus and minimize the delays caused by the unintentional iteration. I also ran interference with Activision who were publishing System 3's games at the time. The initial game ideas came from a bunch of places, including Phil Harrison and Tim Best. Most of the team and often Mark II from memory. Tusker was one of Tim's concepts. The game's music is a variation on Matt's Last Ninja 2 style with big drum and bass sounds mixed in with some African tones. Initially it doesn't feel like it belongs in the game but after a while you really start tapping your toes and getting into the groove and I say it works really well. It felt massive and in your face and is quite memorable. Not as good as Last Ninja 2's but again complementing the adventure pretty well. Duncan looks back on the project quite fondly though. Looking back it's amazing you can hand program anything that is fun in assembly code with 8 sprites 
out and 255 reprogrammable character cells. Hats off to everybody who pulled that off back in the day, including the artists and musicians, who were able to squeeze something entertaining out of a machine with less memory than most desktop icons use today. And yet again, Tusker was another well-received game in the press and sold extremely well. Zap64 awarded it a sizzler with 90% overall, with C plus VG magazine saying in their September 1989 issue. The puzzly bits combine nicely with the hitting people bits to make a game that plays very similar to the Last Ninja duo, and considering how playable those two were, I'd say System 3 were onto another winner. I really enjoyed the heck out of this game back in the day. It's tough and is not for the faint of heart, but well worth investing the time to experience the whole adventure. And last, but very not the least game of this year was... Myth history in the making. A side-scrolling action-adventure game that has puzzle elements of their previous games, but fuses that with a brilliant platform-style action element. The big thing that got my attention initially for Myth, just like Tusker, was the setting or the story. It was steeped in Greek mythology, something that as a kid I loved just as much as ninjas. Watching Jason and the Argonauts and the 80s version of Clash of the Titan, with my dad, brought all those grand stories about Zeus and Medusa to the forefront. I love these stories and having these elements in the game was just super awesome. Here's Mark on the concept of myth. I wanted to construct a game using stories that people could identify with, something well known. So we began researching myths such as the Hydra, Medusa and the Norse legends with the idea of putting them into a game. The production of Myth, just like Tusker, started in 1988 and took well over a year to complete, which was a really long period for an 8-bit game, considering most of them were usually put out in a couple of months. They had the team of Pete Barron and Bob Stevenson on programming and graphics duties. They had just done the excellent C64 conversion of Salamander before getting this next gig. They initially read System 3's documents on the game and felt although it was detailed, maybe it was just a little bit too obscure for most people and required too much knowledge of the mythology to play. They spoke to Mark and suggested their newer designs. Pete explains what happened. We thought they had gone too in depth. Our impression was if the myth was not pretty much common knowledge then they would be too obscure for a lot of players. So we went out and bought a few children's books. With one title from Penguin I remember being particularly useful for source material. Anything aimed at pre-teens we saw as being full of perfect stuff to put in the game. The basics of the story has your character, a regular kid who gets summoned, kind of like the avatar from the Ultima game, to fight and take down Dameron, a demon lord. Only in defeating him would our hero be sent back to his own time. Welcome to myth. The game itself would bounce through history and mythology and features Hades, Greece 400 BC, Scandinavia 900 AD and ancient Egypt 3000 BC. The game was big and there was a lot going on and yes Peter on how the programming duties went down. It was an ambitious game and Mark was always keen to get the product out very quickly. Consequently we were up against some pretty harsh deadlines and in the end we went over quite significantly. Fortunately by then it was gone far enough that everyone could see the game was going to be something special. The graphics were brilliant, I just loved the use of rotoscoping for the main character. It gave the game that really cool flashback or impossible mission look and feel. There were also a whole lot of cool effects type moments. I really love the rainstorm lightning effect on the Viking ship in particular. And that movie style intro sequence really set the style for this game and a few other System 3 games going forward. I was definitely not expecting that last level of the game to be a scrolling shoot 'em up, which pretty much came out of left field, but I still totally enjoyed it. Yaz Mark on the inclusion of that particular level. We felt the shoot 'em up genre was still popular and that after all the platforming and puzzling the player would want a change and that it would be a pleasant surprise. The gameplay besides that shoot 'em up section is pretty much action platform. The puzzles involve some basic knowledge of mythology, like for example chopping off Medusa's head and using it to take out the Hydra by turning it to stone, much like in the movies or books that I mentioned earlier. Sword play was also used for the action segments, as well as some shooting style action. The music and sound effects were in a league of their own, with Dutch composer and my favorite Sid artist Jerome Tell taking up duties this time. He composed one of the coolest intro tracks that synced up so well and is absolutely amazing and is a must listen track from this game. Programmer Peter Barron was very happy with the end results. I still get a big buzz every time I see a new fan site or a good reference to the game. I'm hugely proud of it. 
The game was finally released at the end of 1989, with it as usual getting a unanimous great reviews across the board with Zap64 giving it a 94% overall saying, Clash of the Titans was never this good. The game never got a US release on the C64 unfortunately, but still sort of got one on the NES. US company Mindscape took the basic game and layered over a Conan the Barbarian license. The game unfortunately is nowhere near as good as the original C64 version, so just stick with that one instead. This game was a firm favourite of mine during that time. I played through it multiple times and I can say it's a real gem in the vast library of the Commodore 64. But I'll leave Mark with the final words on this one. We always aim for the best, so we weren't surprised when Myth got a sizzler and a crash smash. I'm proud of all our games, but this one in particular for the diversity between the Spectrum and the Commodore 64 versions. But it wasn't all sunshine and rainbow over at System 3. There were a lot of changes that took place on the business and personnel departments. First was Activision getting sued by Magnavox over copyright infringement. This is a whole saga that's a video unto itself, so to keep things going, Activision were hit hard. Some much so that the company had to file for bankruptcy. They would however survive and claw their way back to the top, but would never be the same classic company ever again. What this meant for System 3 however, is that the distribution deal was done effective immediately, which was a blow in terms of getting games financed and foreign distribution. That's why most of their titles going forth during this period remained largely in Europe. Plus according to Mark, Activision never paid them in full for all the royalties from 88 and 89's games, which according to him was 80% of Activision's income during this period. But things got worse as Mark's dream team of Hugh Riley and John Twitty left to form their own company with Mev Dink called Vivid Image. The company would only end up releasing a handful of games, but still a stellar lineup of forgotten classics in my opinion, such as Hammer Fist, Time Machine, and First and Second Samurai were just a few of them. And the bad times came in threes apparently with System 3 as a company having a massive turnover rate for employees. It was true they always managed to entice top talent for their games, but no one really stuck around for too long. This was partly due to the fact that most of them were signed up to contract freelance style work, meaning once a game was complete they were gone. But it also had to do with the chaotic nature of working there according to many interviews. And this leads me to introduce you to to Robin Levy, a graphics artist who worked at System 3 from about the 1990 period and beyond. He worked on many games such as The Last Ninja 3 and Turbo Charge, amongst others. He was kind enough to grant me an interview for this documentary and I'll be asking him a bunch of insider questions for the rest of the video. The first thing I asked him was about the contracts and the office vibe at the time. Coders were valued and respected far more than artists. As such, System 3 had a very high churn rate for audio and visual content creation. Creators. It was all a little crazy. While logically any game can't exist without game code, a System 3 game cannot exist without the graphics and sound the System 3 brand demanded. Anyway, apart from deadlock, I never allowed myself to get bound into a contract with them. Mark did try to lock me into an exclusivity agreement in return for a moderate monthly retainer, but I didn't feel it was fair compensation for all the grief. I then asked him about the atmosphere teams was during that time. When I was there, it was just me, Stan Cambry and Mark Kale. Also present but not directly working for System 3 was Alaric Mini, Amiga Tusker Coder renting out a cupboard to work on his own demo, and Tim Best who was renting a corner office with his business partner, but still consulted on System 3 stuff. There was also a string of receptionists and PAs for Mark. Even though they were both running Vivid Image at the time, Mev Dink was formerly the project manager, but we didn't see much of him and John Twitty was available as an occasional technical consultant. Adrian Kale worked there on and off as Mark's PR guy. He's responsible for the Ninja 300% review in your Commodore. Less than a year after I moved there I was joined by Dan Phillips and John Kemp. We had some good times. There was a core group of people, a few office staff, ex-System 3 legends who still lived locally plus a steady stream of external developers coming and going. Lots of stories were shared and large amounts of alcohol were consumed. It's a cliche but we worked hard and partied harder. I don't think anyone was particularly happy working at System 3 and up until the mid 90s it was as if there was a revolution revolving door of people joining for a while then moving on. There was usually some kind of drama on the go that was completely out of our control and that kind of thing tends to bring everyone on the front line closer together. Deadlock almost got unofficially resurrected as an ultra-violent Amiga game but we had all left before it progressed past the sketch
sketching and brainstorming stage. By the end of 93, I think the only people left in house were Mark and Phil. I was long gone by then to work with Jason Perkins on Rough and Tumble. And with that little bit of insider information, let's continue on to... 1990 saw the release of three games. 1989 may have been a bit of a roller coaster, but that didn't in any way slow down the games. System 3's Last Ninja 1 and 2 were the biggest selling C64 games of all time, so their relationship with Commodore themselves was pretty tight. Most people associated those games with the C64, despite them being released on multiple systems. Commodore and System 3 decided to team up, as each could benefit greatly from one another. System 3's games started appearing in bundles for the Amiga, and Commodore were gearing up to release the ill-fated C64 GS or Commodore 64 game system that year. A bungled attempt by Commodore to turn the beloved C64 into a cartridge only console. System 3 would support the system with some high profile releases. Their upcoming game Flimbo's Quest, which we'll get to shortly, would be included in the bundle on a cartridge with three other games. Not only that, but Myth got a re-release with a few minor treats. But it was the last Ninja Remix that Commodore were hoping would entice new C64 adopters to buy the system and System 3 would basically make a lot of money. If you don't know, The Last Ninja Remix is simply a variation on 1988's The Last Ninja 2 with a bunch of bells and whistles and released on cartridge for the GS. And it was obviously compatible with the original C64's cartridge port. I'll give them credit and say that remixes and games didn't really exist until this time, at least not on this scale. Even though, like I said earlier, remixes and remasters are a dime a dozen these days, this was still new territory and again they were way ahead of the pack. Jumping over to the game itself though, it's the same game as 2. The big differences are now it has an awesome animated intro which explains Aramakumi's time travel to New York as well as a new border menu system, other minor graphical tweaks and a soundtrack that was completely remixed and now comprised of tracks from The Last Ninja 1 and 2 completely redone by Rain Overhand. This was the first game that Robin Levy worked on when arriving at System 3 and I asked him what work he actually did on the game and if it was completely rebuilt from the ground up or used the same base code as Ninja 2. Just the intro. I can't remember if we did an outro or not. As far as I know it was the original code base. Stan just coded the intro and hacked the music in etc etc. I moved to London to work on Ninja 3, but when I arrived I was tasked with doing an intro for the Ninja Remix instead. Very early on the powers that be decided I couldn't be relied on to do everything, so they brought in Arthur Van Jolt from the Boys Without Brains who was working on Flimbo's Quest. He drew the Ninja Remix status area. We're not really going to spend too much more time on this game, as it is the last Ninja 2 essentially. It's kind of a strange game also to even recognize. Recommend. I really love the new intro, but otherwise I would recommend just playing the original version instead. For my guess it was a way of trying to reintroduce the series to a brand new bunch of people who might be buying the C64 in the face of the GS for the first time. But more than likely it was an easy cash grab for both companies. And this is what Mark later said about the Commodore deals. It made us a lot of money. It's why we stuck with Commodore so much, whether it was the C64, C64 GS or the Amiga. Can't really argue with that from a business point of view. I guess. The company had to keep on being profitable. And this is what Robin had to say about it. The sole purpose of Ninja Remix was to make money. Creatively I didn't see the point and frankly viewed the whole thing as a bit of an insult to the original creators and gamers. I totally disagree with replacing the music, which I consider a major part of the soul of the original. I do agree, the music is definitely the soul of those games, all three in fact. I think Rain had an impossible job, but he did quite a good job and they turned out well. They are great renditions. But I also feel it's a bit pointless. It's like taking your favorite rock album and getting another band to re-record it. It's just never going to be as good. In a 1990 issue of Commodore format, the game received an overall score of 92% with them saying, The Last Ninja Remix is a great game. Beautifully designed and superbly presented. My only reservation in recommending it is that the cartridge only Last Ninja 3 is almost upon us. But then why not hone your ninjutsu skills with this one, ready for the forthcoming battle. It is a cool game, but then again it's hardly any different from the cool game that came out in 1988. So for me this is a game that is merely a curiosity, that I'd still like to get one day to complete my ninja collection. But besides that, that's pretty much all it is. 
Next was a game that came out of nowhere for me, at least until I opened up one of my newest issues of my magazines at the time and saw that glorious advert. I looked down and saw the System 3 logo. I was immediately sold. Back then finding out about video games was all about magazine information. There was nothing else besides loading up some random games from your latest crack bootleg compilation. Flimbo's Quest was System 3's answer to the onslaught of the NES, or just cutesy platform console games in general. For me personally, Flimbo's release timing was just perfect. I was playing my Japanese Famicom like a madman with all its cutesy platform action, and then in jumped this game on my C64 that totally made me turn off the Famicom and jump back into some hardcore C64 game time. For this game, Mark got some of the guys from the Boys Without Brains and Netherlands demo group that did 1988's Hawkeye for Thalamus. Flimbo's Quest was essentially the same game, at least gameplay wise. The team was headed up by Lawrence van der Donk, Mario van Zast and Arthur van Joel. The plot for the game is basically Super Mario Brothers. The princess gets captured and only you can save her from the mad scientist. Blah blah blah, usual nonsense. Gameplay consists of lots of platforming and running around, blasting creatures, which either drop letters or cash. All the letters spell out a word which gets you out of a level, and the cash can be spent in the shops to upgrade your firepower, buy more letters and various other things. The game was also littered with hidden bonus stages and secret rooms to discover, just like the console games of the time. Game wise it was really big with 7 levels to get through, and the the graphics were absolutely gorgeous with the color palette, animation and parallax scrolling just flowing perfectly. It made you forget about some of those janky NES sprout flicker fests. It was quality. The music made me never want to listen to a Famicom tune ever again. It was bouncy, fun and extremely catchy, all composed by Rain Ohan and Johannes Berlegard and they did a fantastic job. Here's Rain's recollection of visiting System 3 for the first time. The first time I went to System 3 was with Lawrence van der Donk and Mario van Zast. Lawrence did the programming for Flimbo's Quest. I did two tunes for Flimbo's Quest for Lawrence. Mark Kale wanted to meet me and I was introduced by Lawrence. I met Mark Kale and Adrian Kale. I can't remember meeting anyone else there except for the reception girl, which were always good looking if I can remember. <laughs> Nothing special happened that time and I got paid for Flimbo's Quest. Probably underpaid, but I was only 16 years old back then and not a real businessman yet. The programmers though felt they were very underpaid for the job and struggled to get some of the royalties from System 3. Arthur Van Joel attributed this to Mark's pension for buying really expensive sports cars. Lawrence eventually received £2,000 in royalties, although the team felt they were really owed something in the range of £8,000. System 3 were so confident they had a winner on their hands, which they did, that they went ahead and put a Zap Sizzler logo on the adverts for the game and on the Commodore 64's front cover, before Zap had actually reviewed the game. That's pretty cheeky, and I'm wondering if that's why the reason they scored it at 80%, which is a little bit lower than it should have got in Zap. It's still good, although Hawkeye got the ridiculous 96%, and Flimbo's gameplay is much more refined and user friendly. Anyway, this is what Zap had to say. A fun and bonding game, although rather repetitive, which is kind of ironic, seeing as Hawkeye is probably twice as repetitive as this game. Oh, Zap. And the last game we're going to look at for 1990 is... Vendetta, a hybrid action-adventure racing game mixed into one. The game was headed up by Stan Scambry as lead programmer, Paul Doherty on graphics and Matt Gray back for his last System 3 music score. It was another stellar lineup of talent. Stan was another ex-Palace software employee who went on over to System 3. His resume is filled with C64 classics like Barbarian, Cauldron 2, and the Sacred Armor of Anteriad. This was his first game as lead for them, but wouldn't be his last. Vendetta can best be described as a combination of The Last Ninja and Turbocharge, which is a 1991 game we will get to shortly. And the driving sequences in Vendetta were the direct inspiration for Turbocharge's creation. The game's story sees our hero going to rescue his brother and daughter from a bunch of terrorists. Your brother's been forced to build a nuke for them, and they plan to detonate it in one hour real time. The terrorists are your former enemies, so the Please think you are linked to the crime somehow. All of this actually links into the main gameplay, so knowing the story is actually pretty relevant in this one. Number one, the game has a time limit of one hour to complete before the nuke goes off. And unlike the last Ninja series, which is action and puzzle based, Vendetta is very light on the puzzles. Your goal is to kill all the bad guys and collect evidence at each location, which there are seven in total. This evidence is used to obviously clear your name of the crime and lead the trail to the next location, which you drive to in-game. 
game. Vendetta was a fun game. Once you figure out where to go in the levels, the time limit is almost irrelevant as it can be completed pretty quickly. The levels themselves are also much smaller and more confined from the last ninja games, making it easier to navigate. Not having bullets fly across the screen when firing was so weird when I originally played this game, but it's a really cool concept in retrospect. As long as you are facing in the right direction of a bad guy, they are always taking hits, so it's pretty easy. What really caught me off guard though about this game was the awesome driving sections that seemed to come out of nowhere. I wasn't expecting those and they really break up the traditional action adventure elements really well. Turbo Charge would improve on them dramatically, but as segues they are quite excellent. Zap64 loved this game, awarding it a sizzler at 93% overall, saying, a superb combination of two perfectly integrated game types. Most of the other publications were on board with C plus VG giving it 93 and your Commodore 94 overall. I feel Vendetta is a great variation on the Last Ninja formula. It's a bit of a forgotten gem in their large games output I feel. I do miss the music though, besides the intro it's sound effects all the way, which just feels kinda weird for a System 3 game, especially considering their musical legacy. I know Myth does this as well, but it doesn't really seem out of place when playing that. And with that we see the end of 1990. We have one more year of Commodore 64 software to look at with some really big titles to go through. 1991 saw the release of three games. 1991 was a year of transitions. The Amiga had taken a massive foothold on the Commodore scene in the late 80s to early 90s, in Europe particularly, and big first party titles for the C64 were slowing down dramatically. Take a look at any C64 magazine during this period, from about 90 to 93, and the reviews mainly consist of budget and re-release games. The new ones made up a very small percentage of the reviews. System 3 knew this already. They had been making Amiga versions of a lot of their C64 titles, but soon the Amiga was going to take the reins. This was their last year of C64 made games. Now let's jump on over to Turbo Charge, a fast paced racing destruction game that managed to prove once and for all that the C64 was more than capable of doing an extremely good racing style game if the right talents were behind the scenes. For Turbo, Mark got the enormous talent of Chris Butler as lead programmer. Not only was he suited perfectly to this style of game, as his C64 resume was filled with classics such as Commando, Ghosts and Goblins, Space Harrier and Power Drift to name a small selection. He had mastered and honed his craft on fast paced racing style games that most people just couldn't pull off on the old bread bin. He was also a no nonsense talent that just got the work done and stuck to deadlines. Basically he was Mark's dream employee. Filling out the rest of the team was Robin Levy on graphics whose brilliantly beautiful creations are on full display on one of the C64's best shooter maps, Armalite and Sean Connolly on music. He'd end up doing the soundtracks to the C64 Elvira adventure games. Work started on the game in late 1990. It would be a pretty rapid process, but surprisingly it would not affect the quality. The plot for the game plays out with an absolutely brilliant intro sequence setting the stage. We see some Iraqi terrorists break into a military facility and steal a whole stockpile of military weapons. A couple of British agents get sent in their Lamborghini sports car to take them down Chase HQ style. And one can only wonder how cool the C64 version of Chase HQ could have been if this team was on the job. Because we all know how god awful that game was. I asked Robin about the creation of the brilliant intro and endings for this game. For the turbocharged intro, Phil Thornton provided the text and I divide the visuals to fit. Obviously a lot of plot and visual elements were based on news reports we all saw from the Gulf War the previous year. The turbocharged art row was pretty much down to me, even the bad taste. The newspaper was partly inspired by the Vendetta outro which also featured a front page. I had a lot of fun with all the interstitial and loading screens. The first criminal you capture is based on Phil Thornton and the Dominator is based on Mark Kale. I'm glad players appreciated seeing these images as much as I enjoyed making them at the time. Although to this day I have a feeling that some of the images I made for running out of fuel or the car destroyed were never used. The game was a classic style racing destruction game fast driving and blasting action across five massive stages, each one split into two, making it basically ten levels, bouncing you all over the world as you take out each boss character in the terrorist organization, smashing through countries like Saudi Arabia, Iraq, 
Thailand and South Africa. Pretty much every hotspot at the time for criminal activity. Trust me, I lived in one of those countries. I asked Robin what it was like working with Chris Butler, as he was primarily known for his solo work. Me and Chris were total opposites, and I didn't find there was a lot of room for any creativity or fun working on game art for him. He was possibly the most professional coder I've ever worked with, and a safe pair of hands for Mark. Making games was a business to him and he was damn good at it, but it was just a business. It's entirely plausible to me that he never appeared on the retro scene because there's no profit in it. I hope he's well. He didn't mess about and was totally capable of making reasonable if unlovely graphics himself. A driven individual who after years of experience instinctively knew how to make a playable game, but only from Monday to Friday. I wasn't particularly a fan of his work. I reserved that adoration for creators like Braybrook and Minter, but I had to respect his work life ethic. The game played exceptionally controls are tight and it flowed well. You had turbos to catch up to bosses, but that obviously wastes precious fuel. Fuel tankers and canisters were available for pickup and you have unlimited machine gun ammo, but a limited amount of rockets for those insta kills. I asked Robin how long the production took as Chris was known for his lightning fast turnarounds. It would have been a rapid development cycle and I can imagine that at some stage Chris would have been frustrated when art wasn't supplied to him when he needed it because I was put to work on other things. I remember the 3D animations for the vehicles being a massive chore. I can't say with any degree of certainty how long it took to make. After Ninja Remix I went home in Christmas 1990 to get started on Armalite 2. In January System 3 went nagging us to come back for Turbocharge and offered the carrot of Amiga development to the coders and this changed the course of our lives and careers. So I think that Turbocharge was started by Chris in Autumn Winter 1990. I worked on the in-game aspects till Spring 91 as I had the chance to get more into Amiga Work. I distinctively remember working on some of the interstitial screens in the old System 3 office in Pana, yet doing sprites like the A-10 attack chop and the Robocop villain van in the new offices in Harrow. The intro was definitely done in Harrow. During this time I was working from home as a freelancer and hot desking in the office from time to time. Ultimately none of this seemed to matter to Chris as he didn't drop a beat and just finished off all the level graphics himself. Hats off to him really. Some of my favorite aspects of Turbo are all those little graphical details and fun gameplay elements. As your car takes damage from the bad guys, bullet holes litter the screen until your car eventually explodes. The sheer variety of bad guys and scenery changes is amazing, with very satisfying explosions and being able to just blast everybody on the road without consequence was so awesome. I also like the forks in the road where you had to make a quick choice. A wrong one sent you down a tunnel to your immediate death. There were though plenty of visual markers in letting you know which one would be the bad choice so it wasn't just a case of randomness either. I asked Robin how they managed as a team to crack out such a brilliant racer on the first go. I didn't have a great degree of input on the design which was documented by an external designer and I was beaten down and told to stick to the script quite early on. The only ideas I really brought to the table were for the status area. Some of the baddies like the A-10, attack chopper and the chase HQ rocket launcher mechanic. When it comes to gameplay and some of the graphics, credit must go to Chris Butler. He knew what he was doing and committed to a design document which he was going to stick to. Even if it featured such oddities as armies of 30 foot tall border guards, Chris had achieved the impossible with respectable conversions of two or three fast 3D arcade games. By the time he hit Turbocharge, his workflow and engine were pretty well refined. And if you want to know more about Butler and his games, please check out my profile on Chris himself in my One Man and His Machine series. And if you like this genre of game, you can also check out my Top 10 C64 Racing Destruction game video. One guess which is number one. Turbo cleared house and sales and in the reviews racking up a whopping 96% in Zap and gaining the coveted gold medal status. Zap said a stunning arcade experience blindingly fast and exceptionally violent. This was another one of those games that made me turn off my newly bought Mega Drive and dive back into some serious C64 gaming. It's time for the final C64 game System 3 ever released and it's a fitting end to the computer that served them so well and a franchise that made the company what it is today. Here it is, The Last Ninja 3. With the original team of Riley and Twitty still at Vivid Image, Vendetta's Stan Scambry stepped up as lead programmer with Robin Levy on graphics and Rain Ohan was signed up for music. It was a fresh slate of talent for the final entry, but would it be enough to sit as tall as its predecessors? 
It was a pretty high mark to reach. The team would have the advantage of the integrator program, which they could use and modify, and was originally designed by John Twitty for putting together the first two Lost Ninja games. And even though Riley and Twitty were working on Vivid Image games, they were available for technical consulting. But mostly the new team wanted to make the game their own if they were given the chance. The story this time has Armakuni going up against the Shogun Kunotoki one last time. The game takes place in Tibet and across the realms of earth, water, wind, fire and void. The Shogun wants to destroy these temples that hold the power of the ninja and therefore destroying Armakumi's clan once and for all. As soon as this game starts you are greeted with the best C64 intro bar none. The combination of atmosphere, graphics, music and sound effects all flowing together effortlessly to introduce the new setting and story. I asked Robin about the creation of this intro and how it was designed and put together. I can't take all the credit. The music is what made it epic and lots of effort was made to ensure that the music and visuals synchronized well. Shadow of the Beast 2 came out during development and everyone was impressed by the intro. Adrian Kale insisted we base it on the video for Duran Duran's Wild Boys which was the opening shot. I designed everything else. Some things were drawn out in advance but nothing as disciplined as a formal storyboard because my scribblings were only intended as notes to myself. Some things I made up as I went. I'm fairly sure that Rain Owerhand started the soundtrack after the sequence was designed but before all the C64 art was finished. And I like to think that the overall flow and timing is a result of a team of people working together effectively and making some well-judged compromises. Because we had breaks in the flow of the footage for the credits, the timing of the visuals to the music could be easily fine-tuned without having to adjust any animation. Rain also gave us sound effects that could be triggered at will by John Kemp who put most of it together. The Ninja 3 outro was far less complex but still needed to be visually rewarding and I pretty much designed this over a cup of coffee. There isn't a lot to it. Neither the intro nor outro tell much of a story but we were very pleased with the results. Gameplay wise Ninja 3 keeps it pretty much the same as its predecessor although there are some interesting and often overlooked additions which most people never talk about. The main addition being the Bushido system where you have to build up the bar at the bottom by fighting honorably. For example fighting a guy using fists if he has no weapons or not using superior weapons against a foe with lesser weapons. Also running away from fights. If you fight the Bushido away the bar can be maxed out which will make you much stronger and help you with taking out the end of the level boss character. Here's Mark explaining the system. Bushido is all about honor and fighting and it was all there in what we were trying to do. But again I think it was lost on a lot of people. We wanted to make the combat more than just tap tap tap. So you had to power up your abilities to achieve certain tasks. And then once you had your Bushido indicator at full power it made it easier to take on the boss at the end of the level. The puzzles were also a bit more devious and a lot required the combining of items to make something else. In retrospect it was much harder. And I remember being stuck on certain parts of this game for weeks until I found some scrap of info in one of my magazines with a solution to a puzzle. It took me months to finish this game, at least the first time around. And he has mark on people's expectations for new features during this period. Lost Ninja 3 was right at the end of the 8-bit era and people were asking for more and more sophistication. The puzzles weren't straightforward enough all the time and that made the game a little bit more frustrating for people. Yeah okay it seemed obvious to get a combination of things together and make something that you could use. But I think that when things become too challenging you turned off the mass market and at the times Lost Ninja 3 was a little bit too challenging for some people. The levels are truly beautiful to look at, each one representing a different realm and capture the best look and style what the C64 was able to do. I especially love the use of color for each realm. I asked Robin where do you even start off graphics wise when making a game of this size. The sprites were based on Hugh's template and I can't really take much credit there. The screens were mapped out by the late Tim Best who sadly passed away over 10 years ago. He designed all three ninja games and never seems to get a fair mention in official interviews. Before I moved to London I was given a rough brief, ninja sequels set in a Tibetan monastery and sent a paper map of World 1 as well a couple of discs with a copy of the integrator the editor used for putting together all the screens and the level data from the first two games. I then did a couple weeks of getting to know the integrator and putting together reference for the setting. Luckily I found a big book on Tibet in a local cut price bookstore which I bought and this was my main source of reference. 
I still have the book which is well worn with strips of paper I used to bookmark pages of interest. I filled the sketch pad drawing out objects that I thought might be useful. Work started in earnest on the levels after I finished on Ninja Remix. Arthur Van Joel was also hired to do half the levels, earth, wind and water. I wasn't keen on this as there would have been a difference in style and the tight working practices needed for the integrated screens, hence why Ninja 3 only has 5 levels. Originally there was a dedicated earth element level that resembled a cavernous mine but the version we got for that was unusable. We didn't have time to completely recreate it so changed the mountain level from being an introduction to the game to represent the earth element. I also completely redrew the original water level. I only had time to optimize what he did in the wind level so this part of the game features some Arthur Van Joel art. The themes of the levels were also very cleverly integrated into the story which until reading this quote from Mark recently I didn't even realize he has Mark's interesting explanation. We wanted to keep the theme of bosses, so you were trying to take on the Shogun that had ultimate mystical power in the sixth dimension. There were six levels and the six bosses were different incarnations of the Shogun. It wasn't obvious enough but that gave you 666. The music was always a massive part of what made the ninja game so popular. And with two almost flawless soundtracks already done, Rain had his hands full. In my opinion it's a great soundtrack, a couple of forgettable tunes but mostly great stuff. The nature of the realms meant that the soundtrack had to complement that earthly feel of the game and it does it pretty well. It obviously can't compete with the originals but it's still a wonderful score that shouldn't be dismissed. He has rain on working on the Ninja 3 soundtrack. So I talked to Stan Skembri who programmed the game about the themes of the levels and about how much memory I could use and got started. When I was about finished I went to System 3 again and let them hear the tunes. When I got there all the empty rooms were filled with guys who were programming and drawing the game. Here I met Stan in person and the guys from Cyberdyne Systems, Robin Levy and Dan Phillips. Stan was still programming on the game and Robin and Dan were busy on the intro for Last Ninja 3. I also got a room and started to make the end sequence tune and made the thunder sounds for the intro of Last Ninja 3. I made the intro tune at home but it was not intended to be the tune for the intro but for a level tune. I almost threw it away because I thought it wasn't Chinese enough but Stan loved it for the tune. And I always wondered why Matt Gray wasn't invited back for Ninja 3 and here's the man himself explaining what really happened and why. Well if things had moved a little quicker I'm sure I would have done Last Ninja 3. Basically directly after Last Ninja 2 I was twiddling my thumbs for several months doing conversions for Outrun and Afterburner that were never used. It was only later in 1988 that I started on Tusker and then Dominator early 1989. I remember I remember being quite frustrated in the summer of 88 with nothing to get my teeth into. Last Ninja 2 had been completed between late January and May. I'd have preferred something original to work on but had to wait until September for Tusker. So yes if we had not parted ways in March 1989 I'd have liked to have done Last Ninja 3. But hey the maniacs of noise had arrived on the scene and Rain Ohan's work on Last Ninja 3 was ace. I like a lot of the references to the previous games as well, such as the lily pad sequence which is a throwback to Lost Ninja 2's boat sequence and the lava stepping stone part which you could just bypass but was obviously there as a last joke to that infamous piece of game design. The game also came really late in the C64's life cycle so I think a lot of people missed out on this one. I myself couldn't even get physical copies of C64 games anymore as my local computer stores had all switched to PC and Amiga software at that point so I unfortunately had to settle for a cracked copy to get my ninja fix. I really liked the game but it was just never to that same level as the others. Something was missing, that little bit of ninja magic somehow. Was it because the game came out so late and I was preoccupied with my mega drive? Or was it that the gameplay was still essentially the same as a game that came out in 1987? Or did the new team fall short on the grand expectations? I would say it's a little bit of everything really. Here's Robin on trying to live up to that legacy when working on this game. Lots of stress, mostly for Stan but not for any of those reasons. Although Stan and myself started off wanting to make our own mark on the franchise we weren't really given the chance to make a good game. Like Remix it was intended as a money maker but the schedule was all over the place. Goalposts would be constantly shifted meaning we could never plan what we are going to do too far in advance nor allow any slippage to the schedule to deal with problems as they arise. 
lots of time was wasted because demos were demanded that must have the most up-to-date features and new formats like the C64 GS were dropped on us out of the blue. So yes, it was very stressful for Stan and wasn't a lot of fun for me either. To be honest, if the original staff were available, they would probably have done a better job of the game. They certainly might have had a lot more leverage to keep the whims of System 3 management under control. I should also confess that I was never a fan of either of the Last Ninja as games. I found neither of them challenging or fun to play. I did however admire the technical achievement and art. Most of all I loved the music. And here's Mark's take on the final results of Ninja 3. At that time John Twitty had left System 3 and formed his own company with Mev Dink, which he consequently left to rejoin System 3. He provided technical support for Last Ninja 3 but by no means do we feel that Ninja 3 was the best in the series. When working with such talented people as John Twitty and Hugh Riley, there was always a certain amount of magic and things just flowed. With some other developers they were always trying to escape the nemesis of the past. I think the programmers on Ninja 3 were always trying to outdo John Twitty rather than make a great game. It wasn't as good as it should have been. Reviews for the C64 version were stellar with the aforementioned 100% review in Your Commodore being obviously way over the top to the more reasonable 93% in the March 1991 issue of Zap64. It was a fitting end to the entire Ninja legacy. This game was still great despite not being the legend I wanted it to be. It's still brilliant in its own way, top quality production in all aspects. And if you were stuck on one of the last Ninja games in the early 90s and called the Ninja Hotline at System 3, you may have been talking to Robin himself. I did know the games very well. I ended up spending a lot of time in the office after hours or pulling all nighters and a few times a night I'd answer the phone to people calling the Ninja Helpline for tips on how to beat both Ninja games. I was very helpful. Chances are, if you rang System 3 offices in 1990 to ask how to get across the bog, river or crates, how to scale the wall in the wastelands, how to get past the dragon and where to get the nunchucks in Ninja 2, it was me you spoke to. And here's Mark summing up his thoughts on the whole series. I'm immensely proud to have produced and created The Last Ninja and we have a lot of fond memories of The Last Ninja games. In terms of sales, they were far bigger than Tusker or Vendetta. The Last Ninja and Last Ninja 2 were distributed by Activision and the sales of Ninja 1, 2 and 3 on the C64 were over 23 million copies. That's quite incredible because Commodore only sold just over 20 million machines in total. And the final game for 91 was Fuzzball, released on the Amiga. Now I'm not going to go too much into this game as this was a C64 focused documentary. But the game was a cutesy take on arcade action that was going around at the time, very reminiscent of Bubble Bob and a whole bunch of other popular arcades during that period. The reason why I mentioned this game is because it's supposed to have got a C64 release as well, but for multiple reasons its fate was cancelled. Actually worked on this game and I asked him the reasons for its demise and also on finally pulling that plug on Deadlock. The Amiga had my full attention at the time so I presume Fuzzball was cancelled because the C64 mark for a game like that wasn't large enough for Mark to warrant all the money needed for finishing development of the game marketing, duplication, distribution, etc, etc. I did a little work on converting the art for the C64 for a coder who ended up leaving. His associate stayed and took over the entire development, including redrawing all the art. It's a shame it got canned. He was doing a fantastic job and I honestly thought his graphics were better than mine on that game. Deadlock was cancelled because I demanded we be released from the contract in return for moving away from home to work on Last Ninja 3 for System 3, who at the time had lost their dream team when they left to set up Vivid M. Deadlock had a troubled development that I have talked about many times elsewhere, but the System 3 we signed with was no longer the creative powerhouse we thought it was. Support was lacking and we were forced to bodge many aspects of the design and content to achieve milestone payments so we could live, but all that just weakened the final product. Being able to close the book on Deadlock after 18 months of loads of stress and not much money was a huge relief to us, but I do regret that we couldn't finish the game we wanted to play because it was crippled by the graphics so early on. And my final question I asked Robin was, what was it like actually working with those legends like Stan Skembri and Chris Butler, especially considering how young he was at the time. We were all there to do a job and those kinds of pleasantries are all over and done with quite quickly when you live and work with someone. Sure I knew these guys worked, but I really wasn't a fan of either of their games, although we did enthusiastically talk about their years of experience in the games industry. But you must bear in mind that these guys were there to do a job quickly and cheaply, so anything that would jeopardize the tight deadlines we had was stamped on hard. I was more excited to meet the likes of Doc, Doug Hare, Jason Perkins and Gary Lydon who were setting up strange ways where 
I worked with for a short while. That was a fun time. To be honest though, at the beginning I was like a rabbit in headlights due to being a naive and very introverted country boy with virtually no life experience being dropped into the big wide world. Scary. These games meant so much to me growing up, a massive part of my childhood and wonderful memories of days past. Replaying all of these and researching the history behind them was a huge nostalgia trip that really brought a smile to my face every day I worked on this video. So like me, you're probably wondering what ever happened to all those movers and shakers that helped form System 3. Mark Kale is still president of System 3 to this day and the company continues to flourish, moving over to games distribution in the later 90s and introducing some new and popular series like the Constructor Games to their library as well as the Ferrari Challenge series, which going by Mark's love of sports cars must have been a dream project of his. They also acquired the Epic's license to all their games and released the Impossible Mission Remix game to the Wii Switch and many other formats. Mark has mentioned his desire to do California games as well, but nothing has come yet as of making this video. John Twitty rejoined System 3 in the 90s after the collapse of Vivid Image to become head of games production. He's overseen everything from Mob Rule, Putty Squad, Ferrari Challenge and so much more. He's still there to this day. Robin Levy continues to work in the games industry working on and off with System 3 over the last 5 years, on the Constructor series and more. With the C64 Classic Armalite, the Amiga Gem Rough and Tumble and the brilliantly underrated Medal of Honor Infiltrator on the Game Boy Advance, you should really play that game. To his credit, Robin continues to hone his craft. Matt Gray has been working tirelessly over the last decade on his reformation series of albums, re-recording his own Sid classics and many other artists best works for his Kickstarter releases. I'd highly recommend checking these out, as well as the brilliant Lost Ninja 2 vinyl release I mentioned earlier. As for Rain Oahand, after Lost Ninja 3, he said his passion for C64 composition faded as he went to study music at the Conservatory in Rotterdam. He did however do tunes for Deadlock that were never released. He has joined the band The Foss Loaders on occasion to play some of his Lost Ninja 3 tunes for live audiences to enjoy. Unfortunately many people associated with these games have sadly passed on including the duo of Antony Lise and Ben Daglish who did the original Last Ninja soundtrack. Stan Scambry and Tim Bess have all passed on and are a great loss for gaming. At least their legacy will always live on in the games they made and the joy they brought to so many people. There are obviously many many more people involved with the making of so many of these games but for now this video has finally reached its end. So I really appreciate you taking the time to check out this video on one of my personal favorite classic companies. I'm Bastish B. If you can please like and subscribe, that'll be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you next time. Cheers.